The material contained in the following program is designed for informational purposes only. It is not intended to replace existing training policies or guidelines of individual law enforcement agencies. Stuff You Never Ever Learned at the Academy is presented by In the Line of Duty, still law enforcement's only provider of reality-based video and online training. See why we are absolutely your best choice for an online training partner, both for quality of product and economy of cost. To receive our online training for a full year, for departments between two and ten officers, the cost is $395 in total. Between 11 and 25 officers or students, $595. 26 to 50, $895. 51 to 100, $995. Between 101 and 150, $1695. 151 to 200 officers or students, 1995. For 200 or more, please contact us. Visit us here at lineofduty.com. Click on this red box. Get a free two-week trial and check out any of our hundreds of programs, courses, and classes. Questions? Call 800-462-5232 or email info at lineofduty.com. Make In the Line of Duty your online training provider and partner wherever you are in the world 24-7. Give your officers and students the most amazing gift of officer safety. This is stuff you never, ever learned at the Academy. I'm Ron Barber. As Idaho investigators continue to try to put their finger on the vicious murderer of four young people, I wanted to put my two cents in. Probably in this day and age worth less than a penny, but still, here it is. My idea for a public service announcement that not only cops in Moscow, Idaho can use, but also law enforcement everywhere in the event you too may face off with a brutal unknown killer. I'm calling it Ron's Checklist. Do you know a killer? It goes like this. First, give your name, rank, department, and the crime you are seeking to solve. Then follow up with these critical questions for members of the public. Do you know of anyone who recently came home with blood-soaked clothing around the time of the murders? Then provide that time frame. If so, did he tell you why the clothing was blood-soaked? Exactly what became of that clothing, do you know? Since blood residue can remain on clothing, did you note that a subject's clothing may have just disappeared around the time of the murders? Do you know someone who unexpectedly came home with clothing he wasn't wearing when he first went out around the time of the incident? Do you know anyone who suddenly, unexpectedly, decided to do a very thorough cleaning of his vehicle in the time period immediately following the murders. Did it make you wonder why? Do you know anyone who has expressed a sudden, unexpected interest or even obsession with the murders and talks about them incessantly? Or an individual who unexpectedly becomes extremely jittery nervous, or even angry when he sees coverage on TV about this incident. Perhaps may even demand the TV be turned off. Has anyone you know unexpectedly become very sullen and withdrawn, almost in a shell, or much more deeply reserved than usual since the time of the murders? 
Do you know anyone who had sudden or unexpected cuts on his or her hands, fingers, or arms in the days after the slaying? Did you ask the individual about them? And did you find the response credible? Did anyone recently use bandages or other resources to treat unexpected cuts or injuries to the hands, fingers, or arms? Of course, that includes purchasing same at a local pharmacy or even through Amazon or UPS. Do you know someone who has unexpectedly taken to wearing long-sleeved clothing or gloves even when they are not called for given the weather conditions? Do you know anyone who has an obsession with knives and perhaps has even discussed using them for violent purposes against anyone? Here's a knife similar to the one used in the murders. Do you know anyone who has expertise with such knives, who carries them on his person regularly, and who may have been in the neighborhood of the murders in that time frame? Do you know someone who unexpectedly purchased a knife similar to it not long before the slayings? Did that knife suddenly disappear shortly after the murders? Did somebody in your realm return home on the night of the murders at a very unusual hour when compared to normal? Has somebody in your acquaintance suddenly and dramatically varied his or her schedule for no seemingly appropriate reason? Has someone asked you to keep a secret that could possibly have anything to do with the murders? Do you know anyone who suddenly left the area for no apparent reason right after the slayings? Do you know anyone who may have altered his or her appearance following the murders, grown a beard or shaved one off, colored his or her hair? For any other reason not mentioned here, have you seriously considered contacting the police about the murders and not done so? If so, is it time you had the courage to make that contact? This checklist is for your use as a public service announcement or cherry-picked for your internal investigation. Basically, all crime scenes have these same fundamentals. By the way, here are previews from two of our excellent programs dealing with crime scene preservation. First, Volume 4, Program 7, Crime Scene Preservation for Street Cops. The first obligation of first responders is to render assistance to victims, but of primary importance, control access to the scene to protect that very fragile evidence. The first thing is to control access. Now, naturally, there's responsibilities of render aid to see if there's anyone injured and to make sure that you render aid to them. And, and uh, if the emergency medical services are needed, call them and to locate suspects and witnesses. But also, they have to be thinking physical evidence and to, and to control the access. Uh, some, you know, the old adage of too many cooks spoil the soup. And what I try to teach young police officers in the academy setting is if you need additional help, call all the help you need, but don't call any more than you need. If you need one person to watch the front door, call one person, but don't call 10, because if you call 10, the other nine are gonna end up inside the crime scene. The more people you have walking through a crime scene, touching, stepping on things, either adding to or taking away from the scene, they may be carrying items into the scene that, don't, that shouldn't be there, or carrying items out, or destroying items that could be in there. And it is uh, 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 probably the number one uh, error. Secondly, Volume 12, Program 8, Forensic Death Scene Investigations, What Cops Need to Know. If it's still a fluid, violent crime scene when you arrive... You do the best you can on crime scenes. 
Certainly, there could be still a shooter. There could be people running in and out. You have first aid people, paramedics, rendering aid to your victim. That has to be number one. It's after that is over and all of that tension is gone, the adrenaline has come down, that we can clear the room, the house, the block, whatever it is, and then go to work. Homicide investigator Todd Magurosi of the Polk County Sheriff's Office in Florida also says one often overlooked but crucial element at a crime scene is securing the witnesses. It is vital responding officers do not get so wrapped up keeping everyone away that they forget to ask the simple question, did you see what happened? These programs are available to you online. Simply click here to access our online store at lineofduty.com. The programs are just a download away for you. I hope this checklist has been helpful. Comments, questions, email info at lineofduty.com. Thanks for watching Ron's Checklist. Do you know a killer? And that's stuff you never ever learned at the Academy.